live and streaming are, to the yeah, internet. We are live. Um, we are live. Excellent. Uh, welcome everyone to the third in our series of Edinburgh Lectures in Language Evolution. Um, we're halfway through and uh, we've enjoyed fantastic talks from um, Ev Fedorenko and Tom Griffiths already. If you haven't been able to see them, you can join the thousands who have, who have watched these already on uh, YouTube. Um, and uh, please do come again next week for our final speaker, Asfa Majid. Um, this talk is uh, part of a series that we're running here at the Centre for Language Evolution in Edinburgh, and it's been made possible by the fantastic efforts of our three student organisers, um, Elizabeth Pankratz, Ashleen Keo, and Henry Conklin, so thanks very much to them. Um, and I'm going to hand over to uh, Professor Kenny Smith to introduce our first speaker. Uh, uh, not our only speaker today, but our <laughs> first speaker. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Simon. Um, it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce Professor Tecumseh Fitch. Tecumseh is a professor of cognitive biology at the University of Edinburgh. He applies the comparative <laughs> method from biology. Really? <laughs> to, to, to studying the um, evolution of speech, language, and music, um, obtaining insights by comparing um, anatomy and cognition across a, a wide range of species. So I think Tecumseh has been a major figure in the development of uh, evidence-based and um, rigorous study of the evolution of language. So you, as, you, as you may be aware, historically, and actually until quite recently, um, language evolution has been slightly dogged by kind of overly speculative um, ungrounded um, approaches. Tecumseh has led the way in demonstrating how, with a bit of careful thinking and a bit of um, methodological ingenuity, we can make our um, theories precise enough to generate testable predictions, then actually generate evidence to evaluate those um, theories, and in some cases reject um, quite well-known claims in the literature. So I think um, Tecumseh's approach resonates with um, what we're trying to do here in Edinburgh and, and, and compliments it. So I'm excited um, hearing his uh, latest thoughts on how to um, bring the study of language evolution into the, the modern age and, and develop a, a scientific study of the evolution of language. Thanks. To come, to come over, over to you. You can, you can fix whatever I mangled in my introduction. Hey, thanks. No, you just said I was a professor at the University of Edinburgh, and I wasn't I'm sure sorry. if I should interpret that as one, a job offer or what. <laughs> one, one day, one day, the, the letter's in the post. Sorry. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen, uh, and you guys should see my slides now. Yes? Okay. Uh, well, thanks for the kind introduction, Kenny. I, I, that's uh, very kind indeed. I certainly am, am doing my best to try and make this field a little more scientific. And for those of you who I've known for a long time, we've I think we've all been doing it together. Um, and this is kind of a new talk. I, I designed this for this particular audience because I wanted to make sure that the biological perspective on language evolution is well represented here. Um, and I, you know, I watched Ev's talk focused on neuroscience and Tom Griffith's talk fo uh, focused on cultural evolution and kind of computational approaches with great uh, admiration. Um, so I, I'm going to try and complement those talks today. But before I dive into any data, um, I want to start with a little story that I think many of you will find familiar. So um, we can suggest what seems to be the simplest speculation about the evolution of language. Within some small group from which we are all descended, a rewiring of the brain took place in some individual, call him Prometheus, yielding the operation of unbounded merge, applying the concepts. And Chomsky goes on to say, Prometheus had many advantages, capacities for complex thought, planning, interpretation, and so on. So I think most of us are familiar with this story, which Chomsky, in, in his defense, sort of says, this is a fairy tale, this is speculation. But I think if we're going to speculate, this is the simplest speculation um, kind of around. And notice what he's suggesting is that the original origin of the merge function, which is at the heart of recursive of built, recursive structure building in language, was really about concepts, about uh, building up cognitive, cognitive structures rather than communication. 
Now, of course, Chomsky knows that we use language for communication, so he goes on in the same, th this is actually an excerpt from a talk that he gave in 2009. Um, uh, he goes on to say that the capacity would then be transmitted to offspring coming to predominate. At that stage, there would be an advantage to externalization, so the capacity might come to be linked as a secondary process for externalization and interac interaction, including communication. So he, he gives this first stage a name, Prometheus. This is the guy who gets Merge. Um, he doesn't give the second stage a name, but I think it's implicit here that we actually kind of have two stages. There's first Merge and then this stage of externalization. So I've tried to be a little more specific about what that stage would involve. And given the, um, the, the lucky person who actually developed those abilities to externalize the name Athena, in the sense of Athena uh, springing from Zeus's brow. So first comes concepts, then comes externalization. And Chomsky goes on to say, it's not easy to imagine an account of human evolution that does not assume at least this much in one or another form. And at the beginning he says, this seems to be the simplest speculation. So this, this, as I said, I think a lot of people are going to be familiar with this idea. Um, Chomsky said it in many talks and in many different places in publications in the last 15 years or so. And it's come in for a lot of abuse. A lot of people have said, look, this is ridiculous. The idea that there's this one person who has this ability or the idea that merge and concepts come first versus communication is putting the cart before the horse, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a, there's a uh, review by Christina Baim that says, look, what, what did she say? This is absurd. She's, or no, she said it's outrageous. It's from a biological perspective. This is so outlandish that everyone rejects it. And I don't think that's true. I don't think there's anything particularly outlandish about this. First of all, of course, mutations or new traits occur in individuals. That's the way natural selection, uh, that's the way biology works. And then they go on to have offspring. And if the trait is advantageous, it spreads through the population. There's nothing outlandish about that. I think we could argue about whether this idea that first concepts and then externalization makes sense, but whatever it is, it's not crazy. It's not outlandish. Um, but I don't think it's the simplest idea. So if we want to go down that route, the parsimony route, here's a new tale. I'm going to, I'm going to name this protagonist Eve. So in a single mutation, both merge and the capacity to externalize that and use it for communicative functions happen. And because Eve has kids and she uses this capacity with her kids, um, they go on and they're the ancestors of us all. So her offspring are us. And I would argue that that's a simpler um, argument or a simpler story, a simpler tale, in the sense that it only involves a single event. Now, of course, many of you are thinking, well, wait a minute, how likely is it that a, 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 a mutation or in a single individual, all of these capacities appear at once? Okay. And I would, I would agree with most people that that's very unlikely indeed. I don't think it's, it, there's a, either a single gene or a single stretch of the genome that could suddenly mutate to give us all of these capacities at once. Nonetheless, I would argue that it's a simpler hypothesis, which sort of suggests that maybe simplicity isn't the only metric we should be using, or at least simplicity in the normal parsimony sense of, you know, how many, how many events do we allow in our story? So let's go on. Um, I, can't, I can't leave out culture because I'm talking to the group at Edinburgh, so what about culture? What, what, what's the role that culture plays here? So here's another tale. Two twins, Romulus and Remus, um, as many twins do, they develop their own little sort of private communication system, maybe using gestures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They have a really strong drive to communicate, a Mitteilungsbedürfnis is the German word. And so they devise this private gestural communication system, and it turns out to be useful for all kinds of things. And they're better at hunting, and Romulus and Remus go on to, to, to found this great civilization that basically um, keeps doing this, and the rest is history. Okay, and this is kind of giving credit to the idea of ontogenetic ritualization that Michael Tomasello has talked a lot about. Okay, but of course you might say, well, what, what about sexual selection? Okay, well, um, here's two more characters. I'm gonna I'm gonna be an equal opportunity, both males and females here. So flamboya and flamboyo, and I'm kind of referring to Jeff Miller's sexual selection 
hypothesis that that language evolved kind of like a peacock's tail as an ornament. So you know we have the, our our ancestors had these elaborate vocal displays, and um, the more elaborate and the more convincing they are, the the higher your reproductive success. And these two individuals in the population, one of them, Flamboyo, has, say, meaningful words. Flamboya has hierarchical syntax. Boom, they have kids. And now we get language from that. Okay. <laughs> So I could go on. I mean, it's kind of a fun game. My wife and I sat around for an afternoon drinking beer and thinking of names for all these characters. My purpose here is not to denigrate these kinds of stories. I think all of this is useful as a first stage in driving our intuitions about how language could have evolved. What are the kinds of things that might have arisen and what are the kinds of reasons that those might have been selected for? So the purpose here is not to take any of these and make fun of them though I admit that Flamboya and Flamboyo are maybe a little bit uh, going a little bit far. But look, I don't think there's anything wrong with giving names to these posited uh, protagonists in these stories. But I don't think these kinds of tales are ever going to do justice to the complexity of what must have happened in our species in the last six million years since we diverged from chimpanzees. Because good stories, it's the nature of narrative to oversimplify. Good stories oversimplify, and what we need to do if we want to turn language evolution into a science is move beyond these so-called evolutionarios into the domain of testable hypotheses. So if we want to do that, what do we have to do to turn these kinds of stories, these kinds of mythic tales, into testable hypotheses? And well, and there's no simple answer to that. I think it's going to take a lot of work. It takes a, it's not something individuals do. It's something that we as a field need to do. And it requires a certain amount of discipline on our parts. But I think it is possible. And that's what I want to argue for the rest of this talk. So again, we want to move not not say no to evolutionarios. Those are great. They're, they're great over beers to develop our, our hypotheses and maybe explore possibilities that we wouldn't have otherwise thought of. But the next step is to turn them into something that's concrete. Um, and as I've already suggested, the idea that some story, one of these stories is simpler than the other, you know, you might argue, your intuitions might say, hey, I, I like culture. Romulus and Remus are my guys. Or, hey, I think sexual selection could do it all. It works for birds. Why not Flamboyo and Flamboya? But our intuitions or a metric of simplicity are very unlikely to resolve this story. Um, you know, again, quoting Chomsky, what seems to be the simplest speculation about the evolution of language? It's not easy to imagine an account that's simpler. Well, the Eve story is simpler in the sense that one individual gets it all. It's less simple in the sense that we're expecting some kind of gene or brain rewiring event to actually do all that work for us. So I really don't think we know uh, how likely these things are, and I don't think we should make our arguments based on our intuitions about simplicity, about parsimony. Okay, so that's my intro, and what I want to do for the rest of this talk is, is give you some arguments about the, the, the right way to do the science of language evolution. Starting with some pretty familiar ideas to many of you, the idea that we need to take a multi-component view and talk about proto-languages. I want to say some words about reconciling biology and culture, um, because, and this is partly in reaction to, to long conversation, I mean, to many conversations I've had with Simon, but also to some of the things that Tom Griffith said in his talk. Um, and then in the second half of the talk, I want to talk about two specific phenomena that I think we need to explain if we want to understand the evolution of language, namely our capacity for speech and our capacity for syntax. Um, that's pretty well trodden territory. That's the kind of that's where I trod out. I, I you know do my usual data presentation. So I've really cried, tried to shorten that. I'm going to be pretty succinct about that part of the talk three and four, so that I have more time to talk about the first parts, which I think might be more inspiring for the panel discussion afterwards. Okay, um, what do I mean by language? I mean a system that can convey anything we can think via some kind of signal. And for a suitably equipped listener or perceiver, they can translate that signal back into the original concept. And the crucial thing that differentiates this idea about language is, unlike most systems of animal communication, is the phrase, any of our thoughts, anything we can think. Because virtually all animals communicate, and they're able to communicate some of the things they know about to other individuals. There's nothing special about that at all. 
you know, honeybees can, are pretty fancy. Honeybees can talk about the location of water, the location of flowers, the location of a new hive site. They do it by uh, azimuth relative to the angle of the sun. It's a pretty impressive system. But we also know that honeybees know, for example, about the color of flowers. And there's no place in the so-called honeybee dance language for a representation of color. So, so it's not a language by this definition. Now, there's nothing about this definition that limits to humans. But as far as we know, we're the only species on the planet that has this capacity to, to take anything we can think. And sometimes in a single word, sometimes it takes a whole novel, but we can express those thoughts via language. Okay. Um, and the crucial thing about this idea, I, I've, I've drawn a lot of spaghetti here between concepts and signals, and that spaghetti is supposed to represent what linguists, spend, linguists and neurolinguists spend their life working on, namely the incredibly complex manner in which we map concepts onto signals and back. Um, and I think that the, the, probably the most fundamental idea in the modern study of language evolution is there's a lot of parts to that process. It's a complex thing. We don't capture it by simply saying syntax or even phonology, syntax, semantics, and pragmatics. We really have to start thinking about what are the specific cognitive and neural mechanisms that underlie different components of the system that we've got. And I just listed some of them here. This isn't supposed to be a complete list. But some of them, for example, context-dependent inference, those are clearly things that other primates can do. That's a conceptual ability that we know in, in lots of other species. Speech perception as well. That's something that lots of species, including dogs and cats and parrots and many others, seem to do a quite good job at that. Other aspects, like hierarchical syntax or theory of mind, seem to be much more limited or even potentially limited to our species. So when we take this multi-component view, one of the first questions I as a biologist ask is, well, which one of these are shared with other species? And more specifically, which ones do we share with our nearest living, uh, our nearest relatives, namely the great apes? So we're gonna to wanna to look at chimpanzees and say, do they have these capacities? If, if not, we had to evolve them separately. So, um, and so this is the standard comparative approach to, to, to modern biology introduced by Darwin. Um, when we find a similarity in a group of related species, so let's take us and the other great apes, uh, chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutan, or here I just have the African great apes, and we have all kinds of things that we share with them, relatively large brains, we live a long time, we have big bodies, our childhoods are very long, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, good, quite good with our hands, and all of those capacities that are shared in the extant modern, in the, the existing apes, are present because they were present in a shared common ancestor, which in the case of the African great apes goes back to about 10 million years ago. So those shared traits that are shared by common descent from an ancestor are called homologies, and those are crucial. It's crucial to identify those if we want to understand, if we want to kind of build a time machine that allows us to go backwards in time and say what was present 10 million years ago in that now extinct ape that was the ancestor of us all. And we can deduce that it was relatively large, it had a long childhood, large brain, good with its hands, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a crucial category of similarities that we find in biology. A second category are what are called convergent evolution, where we see shared traits um, in distantly related species, and all the species in between lack those traits. So one example would be um, upright posture, so bipedalism in humans and birds. We clearly don't share that with other mammals, and so it's clearly evolved separately in humans and birds. Another more interesting example is the capacity for vocal learning that I'll talk about later in this talk. In both cases, those are separate evolutionary events that happen in two different clades, and those are equally important in evolutionary biology because they can allow us to start to um, rebuild the selective forces that would lead to a particular trait evolving multiple times. Okay? And I want to give you examples during this talk of both of these kinds of biological similarities, but it's very important to keep them straight. It's very important to keep them separate. Okay, so as I suggested in the earlier slide about the multi-component approach, one of the key questions for an evolutionary biologist is which of these traits are derived relative to our last common ancestor with chimpanzees. So everything that we share with chimpanzees, for example, speech perception or context-dependent inference, 
that was already there. We kind of get that for free as uh, when we're explaining language evolution because it's something that we can study in another species. The things we don't get for free are the things that differentiate us from chimpanzees, bonobos, and other apes. If it just differentiated us from one species, it wouldn't quite be enough. And we have a lot of data on these, um, and I've often grouped these together as the three S's, signal, syntax, and semantics. Um, by signal, I mean the capacity to generate complex signals with our vocal tract. That's something I'll talk about. Um, syntax, I think we all agree, is, is central to the evolution of language. Um, that also seems to differentiate us from other apes. And semantics, certain aspects of semantics, not the capacity for meaning itself. That, that is very much shared by not only with other apes, but with other species. But certain aspects of the intent to communicate, pragmatics, this thing that I referred to as Mitteilungsbedürfnis before. So I think any complete model of language evolution is going to need to explain at least these three, um, and, and perhaps more. I, I don't, I'm not saying this is a complete list. So what we're really interested in is what, what new traits arose in our evolution in the last six million years since we separated from chimpanzees. Okay? So, um, and... This is just another way of addressing this multi-component approach. The, the, the big thing here, which I'm not going to read, is all of the different things that, based on empirical evidence, we know we share with many, many other species, or at least with chimpanzees and other great apes. The three little pillars here are my three S's, the three things that at least these three are derived traits that we need to explain their evolution. And language is basically sitting on top of all of these traits. So it won't do to say that one of them is what makes language. All of them are re required to make language. So these broadly shared foundations, in the rest of this talk, I'm going to take those for granted, not because they're not important, but because we can take them for granted as far as telling, uh, building up evolutionary hypotheses. So the second main contribution of this multi-component approach is the recognition that unless you want to posit that all three, all three of the S's appeared at once in my Eve, which I don't think is very likely, what we want to posit are intermediate steps since our, in the six million years since our evolution from the last common ancestor with chimpanzees, that there were different steps and different of these derived traits occurred at different times. Okay. So and, and one term in uh, evolutionary biology that I like is key innovations. Key innovations are things that happened that weren't just, you know, ornamental or something. They really played a crucial role in the species' success. And I would argue that language is crucial to our species' success. And so whatever these new, whatever the order of these derived traits was, they were key innovations in our species. Okay? So which ones evolved, when, and why? Why were they selected for? And that's really what these evolutionarios that I started off with are gesturing towards, but typically only gesturing towards one or, or, or you know, one or maybe two parts of this big story. Um, so I've, in, in my book, in my 2010 book, I go into a lot of detail. I have a chapter about each of the three big proto-languages that people have been talking about for the last hundred years. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but one of the most obvious is the idea of lexical proto-language, which Derek Bickerton, who sadly passed away recently, um, he was a big proponent of that. And here the idea is pretty simple. First we get words that have meaning, and then we get syntax afterwards. Bickerton doesn't really talk about speech. He doesn't worry too much about um, what, when speech occurred. Uh, Michael Arbib and many others have been proponents of a gestural proto-language, where the first thing that happened was actually we, ex we expressed ourselves using gesture, uh, communicative gestures, probably got syntax and semantics in that context, and then speech was a, a, a late arrival on this scene, according to the gestural proto-language. Um, and then my personal favorite, because it's Darwin's idea and also because I'm a musician, is the idea of musical proto-language, which many people find very non-intuitive, that originally what happened is that we evolved uh, the capacity for song, not semantic words, and that essentially words and syntax congealed out of these songs that our ancestors were making. And again, I'm not going to try and defend this hypothesis here. I just want to show this as an example of a potentially non-intuitive, but nonetheless, I think if you work through it, quite plausible hypotheses. Now, another way of looking at these different hypotheses is that each one posits one of these three, uh, a different ordering 
of these uh, derived traits of the language capacity. So, for example, here's the gestural proto-language which spe with speech last and semantics and syntax first. Uh, here's the lexical proto-language speech kind of you get for free, so then comes semantics, syntax comes last. You get the idea. So I think a, a crucial way of ordering these different models of proto-language is by asking, all right, what are the crucial ingredients? When did they evolve? And what was the selective scenario that led them to be selected? So putting Chomsky's Prometheus hypothesis here, which we might call the merge first hypothesis of proto-language, the first thing that happened in Prometheus was this conceptual ability. And Prometheus might have been running around for a while before his some of his uh, descendants developed this capacity for mind reading and externalization, the communicative aspect. Okay? But it's just another proto-language model, um, perhaps slightly less, um, well, perhaps slightly less intuitive than some of those other ones. But again, as I said, who cares about intuition? This is not a, science is not an intuition, uh, it's not about intuition, it's not about voting, it's about what can we roll up our sleeves and figure out which happened first. All right, um, now, I, wouldn't, I would be remiss in this audience if I didn't say something about culture, and um, of course culture is crucial, of course cultural evolution is crucial, and you know, if, if we accept the idea that language is really central to what makes us human, um, I think we also have to accept that language has two components. Most of the models that I talked about focus on the brain and on the genes behind the brain, so the structure of the brain that allows us to do these various things. But we also can't, once we have communication, we're also going to have cultural transmission of that. Um, and all the kinds of things with iterated learning that Simon and Simon Kirby and Kenny Smith have talked about, or uh, what, what Tom Griffiths talked about in his previous talk, all of that comes into play once you have cultural transmission. And it really broadens the field of what can happen. But I think it's super important to recognize that these two things are not separate. They, are, they feed back on one another. And this is, Kevin Leyland is perhaps one of the biggest proponents of this, but Boyd and Richardson have been saying the same thing. Once you've got a, cultural, a culturally developed phenomenon that plays an important enough role to, have, to play a selective role, that's going to feed back on brain structure. It's going to feed back through normal selection, normal natural selection, back into the biology. Okay? So I think it really is a mistake, and it's unfortunately still a regrettably common mistake, to separate these two things, to separate the biological basis and brains and genes from the cultural um, thing. And I'll, I'm going to call you on this, to, uh, Tom. You, you said, what did you say? The cultural evolution is a viable alternative to selection. Maybe if you're looking at a pretty small time scale, but I think if we're asking questions about this long time scale over six million years, I think we can't assume that those are alternatives. I think we have to assume that those are closely intercalated and that the, the cultural environment of humans has played a crucial role in how we've been selected over the past couple million years. So I th that's why I put this, this uh, feedback loop. It's a, it's a loop between biology and culture. Um, and I just want to give a couple of examples of this from biology. This is kind of textbook stuff that I teach to my biology students. But I, I, I think it really it needs to be emphasized in modern cognitive science because we too readily fall back into this nature versus nurture, this distinction between culture and biology. And I think back to the original founders of, of ethology, we know that that's not the way it works. And I think we really move to, need to move beyond nature versus nurture. And I think the catchphrase that should replace it is instincts to learn. So um, it's a fact that learning happens, not just in our species, but in lots and lots of other species. Um, you know, lots of species are actually quite good at learning and do amazing things. And they also learn from each other. So they so sh sh show social learning. Um, so we can't ignore that. We also can't assume that the fact that learning happens is some kind of counter argument to any innate biological basis for that learning or specifically for language. So, uh, you know, the old idea, this is, goes back to the, to the big debate between the behaviorists and the ethologists back in the late 50s, well, through the 50s and into the 60s. I have Skinner and Lawrence here as illustrations. Um, you know, Skinner was all about learning, as was American psychology for a good chunk of the 20th century. And Lawrence and Tinberg and all the founders of ethology were really focused on instinct because they were amazed by what young animals can do right out of the egg or right out of the, their mother's womb. 
Um, and, you know, there was this big debate, and it was kind of resolved by about 1963 by Tinberg and recognizing that, look, <laughs> these are not alternative explanations. Both of these are part of the story. But I want to give some examples on how, from, from a psychologist's point of view, of how this kind of went down. And hopefully a lot of you have heard of Garcia, John Garcia, who was a student of Skinner's, a devout behaviorist himself. But what he found is that Skinner's idea that there are these universal laws of, of what you can learn, anything, you know, any S plus can be matched to, any uh, positive stimulus can be matched to any response, turned out to not work. It really doesn't work. And in Garcia's case, he'd give these poor little uh, rats water that made them sick, and he would pair that with either a taste or a shock. If you give them water that makes them sick and pair it with a taste, they learn immediately to avoid that taste. In fact, it's sometimes called the Garcia effect, the way if you, if you vomit after eating something, you hate that for the rest of your life. Um, and he also showed that they will never learn to associate a bright light or a sound with that same thing. On the other hand, if you give them an electric shock and you pair that with a sound or a light, they learn that very quickly, but they never learn to pair that with a taste. Okay? So what, what Garcia showed in this, in this a rigorous Skinnerian environment in the Skinner box is that we have strong innate biases on what we can learn. This is what, what Tom Griffiths was calling, this is what biologists call these inductive biases that are so strong in our learning that sometimes they can just override data. And here's an even more interesting uh, example of this. I think it's hilarious. These, these, the the um, Keller, uh, the Brelands were uh, students uh, students of Skinner who went on to found an animal training facility. They moved to California and basically trained animals to do cute things on commercials and to be on Walt Disney movies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they were really good. They knew what they were doing. Um, but they wrote a, a great article called The Misbehavior of Animals that basically skewers the idea of general rules to learn, of, of a non-biased system. And my favorite one is an example of trying to train a raccoon to pick up coins and drop them into a piggy bank. And it's really easy to get a raccoon to pick up the coins and even rub them together like that so it looked like he was really greedy. This was for a banking commercial or something like that. But they were unable to get this raccoon to drop the coins once it had picked them up, to drop them into the piggy bank. And it just got worse and worse. It didn't matter. They got negative reinforcement. They got no positive reinforcement. But of course, what raccoons do is they like to pick up their food and clean it off before they eat it. They'd been given food rewards. And so they simply couldn't drop these things. And they basically just gave up. So I strongly recommend this article. It's full of hilarious examples like this that just show that each species has its own particular proclivities and biases, things it's good at and things it's not very good at. And those strongly shape our, our, our interactions with the world and later our interactions with culture, as Tom Griffiths spoke about quite eloquently. So I think the right way to think about this is a, a phrase, sometimes uh, the phrase nature via nurture is used, but you might as well say nurture via nature, it's, it's a, because it's a cyclical feedback between these two phenomena. I think maybe a clearer phrase is the instinct to learn, and that's what Peter Marler, one of the great birdsong biologists of, of our time, um, called it, an instinct to learn. We're born with an instinct to learn. Birds are born with an instinct to learn their particular species-specific song, and they won't learn the song of another species unless they're really forced to by, by nasty experiments. Okay, and I think now when we come back to language after that uh, deviation through other species, what I want to say is humans are just another biological species. We have our own proclivities and our own biases and our own reward system, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And we have an instinct to learn language in this case. So I think with, with due respect to, to Steve Pinker, whose book The Language Instinct popularized this field so much, I don't think that's quite the right way of phrasing it. I think what we really want to be talking about is the human instinct to learn language. And it has multiple components that, we, that I've already sketched, but that's the right way of kind of bringing together the biology and the culture and seeing them not as, as alternatives or as contradictory, but as part of the uh, as part of the big story about how our species got this amazing capacity. So another way of saying that is what is it that evolved? It's a biologically canalized instinct to learn language. That's what makes our species special. 
it's not we are not born with language, but we are born with very strong uh, a very strong instinct to attach ourselves uh, to to observe certain things in our environment, especially other humans, to to attach meanings to words. There's a lot of things that we're basically biologically prepared for, and that's what we want to explain the evolution of. All right, um, and I just wanted to throw in one last slide before I turn to some data. Um, I, I, I think I, I like this partial differential equation metaphor for how how we can understand the the, the combination of apparent language universals and the amazing uh, diversity of human languages. And you know, the idea here, it's a very simple differential equation, and it creates a kind of space within which, given any particular starting point, you can map out various different curves. So all of these black curves show different solutions to the same set of constraints, to the same differential equation. And I think we can think of different languages, say tonal languages up here versus um, agglutinative languages down there. And you know, obviously, it's not just a two-dimensional space the way I've drawn it here. But we can think of this as a framework for understanding how universals and detailed specifics of individual languages can come about. And of course, what we're trying to do if we're understanding the biological basis of languages, figure out what that under, underlying differential equation is. What are the universal set of constraints that are shared among all humans that can lead to these various different um, trajectories that language takes in culture and that lead to the different languages that we have today? All right. Um, and now I actually would like to just stop right here and, and start the conversation, but I feel obligated by, uh, by, by scientific protocol to give you some data. So for the second half of the talk, I'm going to talk quite quickly. I want to move rather quickly through this material because so many of you will have already heard it. And for those of you who haven't heard it, there's lots of uh, YouTube videos of me talking about it. But I want to now talk about two of these derived components, speech and syntax, and show how we can take a comparative biological approach to understand their biological nature. And in particular, I want to talk about their neural nature. I want to, I want to ask, what exactly is it that evolves? Evolve. I don't want to gesture in the direction of, well, some capacity to do something. But, you know, what actually had to happen? And the reason for that is that only when we understand at a biologically specific level, whether it's in terms of anatomy, well, vocal tract anatomy or neural anatomy, once we understand exactly what the trait is that differentiates us from, say, chimpanzees, then, and only then, can we start to ask, what are the genetic bases that lead to that? Maybe it's a single gene, maybe it's a whole suite of complex interacting genes, but we can't even ask the question until we've accurately identified the phenotype. So that's what I'm going to do for the rest of this talk, is try and show how we can accurately identify the phenotype for two of my three S's, syntax and semantic, I mean, uh, speech and syntax. All right, um, so a very well-trodden fact at this point is that apes, even if raised in a human home, even if exposed very heavily to language from day one, will not learn to speak. And here I show Vicky, the famous chimpanzee, who uh, learned to do lots of things, but she did not learn to speak. Even with intensive training, she, this young chimpanzee never developed the capacity to do more than a few very poor imitations of words. And this has been repeated over and over with all of the great ape species, and in all cases, we see the same thing. They don't learn to speak. They're very clever. They learn all kinds of other stuff, but they don't learn to speak. So that's a, a puzzle, and it was already familiar to Darwin. And already in The Descent of Man, Darwin had identified two hypotheses for why this might be the case, namely that it has something to do with the vocal anatomy, which was a popular idea at his time, or it has something to do with neural anatomy. And Darwin said, well, maybe they both play a role, but I tend to favor the neural argument. So this, this argument has resurrected itself in modern, well, not exactly modern times, let's say in the 20th century. Um, in particular, my PhD supervisor, Phil Lieberman, argued that the descent of the human larynx was absolutely crucial for this capacity to make speech. And if you don't have a descended larynx, you can't produce the sounds of speech. And that's why chimpanzees don't have speech. They just can't produce it. So it's not the neural stuff as much. And in Phil's defense, Phil Lieberman also says, yeah, there's neural changes that had to happen too. He's a bit vague about what those are. But this, the, the red arrows show here this descent of the human larynx. So our larynx is pulled down in our throat relative to chimpanzees.
So one of the first things I did after I finished my PhD was start to ask, well, what do animals do with when, what do living animals do when they vocalize? And we were pretty surprised when we finally got animals to vocalize on x-ray, which is not easy. We were very surprised to see that all of the species we look at lower the larynx during vocalization. And then it pops back up to a high position. So this high position allows most animals to breathe through their nose and swallow at the same time. That's something that we adult humans can't do. So let's look what happens in a dog as it barks. So you're going to see the larynx right here. You'll see that there's a, there's a sealed passageway to the nasal passages between the trachea and the nasal passages. But now watch what happens when he barks. So what you're seeing here is a massive descent of the larynx that happens every time every dog you've ever met barks. This is not a particular thing about this dog. Descent of the larynx is a typical mammalian trait that happens during loud vocalizations. Okay? So I, I note the date here. I published this in 2000, so 22 years ago. And at this point I thought, okay, argument over. Descent of the larynx cannot be the crucial thing that explains why we have language and, and chimpanzees don't. But um, partially spurred by a Simpsons show where, where Homer gets a, chim a monkey and it can't talk because its larynx isn't low, I thought, you know, come on, I've got to do something more than this. And so re more recently, I set out with Asif Gazanfar and Bart de Boer to do this in a rigorous fashion. Lieberman had based all of his models on what monkeys could or couldn't do on dead animals. So basically taking a, a dead monkey and kind of making some estimates of the vocal tract shape and what it could do. What we did was Asif had some monkeys that were trained to vocalize and sit in a chair and we could use x-ray to see what they do. And this is one particular, this is a grunt vocalization from this monkey. And I hope you can see there's that same little movement of the larynx pulling down, just like in the dog. It's a little bit quicker. But what we did was we got all of the different vocal tract shapes that these monkeys could do. We a hundred different shapes. We hand traced them. Um, whoops, where is that? We hand traced them. And then we use those as input to a model that Bart de Boer built. And once you have those vocal tract shapes, it's quite easy actually to do the acoustics and figure out where the formant frequencies would be. So what this allowed us to do was show what the formant space of a monkey would be based on actual data, not based on a dead animal in our estimates, but based on what it actually did in the x-ray. And here's the original, so the, the red triangle is the human vowel diagram, and this our uh, blue triangle shows what Lieberman's original 1969 estimates of what a monkey could do and what we found the actual uh, formant space of a monkey is out here. And now you can see it doesn't overlap exactly with a human space, which isn't surprising. They're not exactly like us. Um, but they were able, this model could produce five very easily discriminable vowels and essentially to us that shows that it's not the vocal tract anatomy that keeps a monkey or a chimpanzee or indeed a dog or a pig from being able to talk. Um, so that leaves us to Darwin's second hypothesis, something about the brain. And again, this is pretty well-worked territory. Uh, there's an old hypothesis that goes back to the 50s that what makes the human vocal tract or vocal tract control special is that we have direct connections from our motor cortex onto the neurons that control our larynx and our tongue and our lips. And those are not present in most animals. I've shown a cat here, but that's the typical situation in mammals, is that these connections from the cortex have to go through intermediate neurons in the brain stem before they get to the actual motor neurons. And we know that in humans and a few other species, there are direct connections that bypass those, those middlemen, those intermediate neurons. Okay? Now, originally, that, that idea came purely from humans. It was only based on a single, on an N of one. And here's where analogy, here's where repeated convergent evolution becomes one of our best friends if we're trying to understand the biology of this stuff. Because if there are other species that can do vocal imitation, they should also share these direct connections. And it will come on as no surprise to you to know that, yes, indeed, Unlike chimpanzees, there's plenty of species that can imitate speech. I'm just going to give you two examples. This is a minor, an Italian-speaking minor bird. Buonasera. Come stai? That's me in the background trying to get him to speak Italian. Come stai? Come stai? Buonasera. 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 
So a pretty remarkable, stick this bird in the corner of a bar. I mean, it was literally in the corner of a bar and it picks up the local language, Italian, with a better accent than I have. Um, an even more entertaining example that Kenny and, and uh, Simon have heard many times is Hoover the talking seal, little baby seal, uh, harbor seal, Die, his mother died in childbirth. He was brought home by a fisherman and raised by this fisherman, finally donated to the New England Aquarium. And when he became sexually mature, so years after this, he was living in a tank with, with other seals, he started making these sounds. Now, I hope my sound on Zoom is working well enough that you can hear. He's going, hey, Hoover. Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. And then he says, get over here, come over here, something like that. Um, it's a little bit clearer in this one. So get over here with the nice Maine fisherman's accent. So again, pretty remarkable example of an animal just picking up from its environment um, the sounds of its ambient environment, in this case, human speech. Um, obviously, these species evolved to pick up mina, mina communication and, and uh, harbor seal communication, not speech. But in this case, the instinct to learn was strong enough that they were able to pick up human speech. So now the crucial thing for all of the vocal learning species is, and, and there are quite a few more. So I showed you seals and uh, uh, one bird, but different bird clades, so parrots, hummingbirds, and songbirds, all of the cetaceans, some bat species, and both species of elephants all seem to have evolved this ability to learn new vocalizations convergently with humans. So these are separate evolutionary events that have happened over and over and over again. And now crucially, these convergent evolutionary events allow us to test this direct connections hypothesis, because if it's correct, then we should expect to see these same kinds of connections in all the species that have vocal learning, and they should be lacking in all those species who don't. Now that hypothesis has only been tested in birds, but in this case, the, the prediction is upheld. So all three vocal learning clades have direct connections from the bird equivalent to motor, of motor, motor cortex onto the neurons that control their, their voice box, the syrinx. Okay, and chickens and hawks and seagulls that aren't vocal learners don't have these connections. Okay, so I think this is a nice example, and and, and of course there's uh, it's a pretty hot topic right now. Uh, I think we're we're going to be hearing about seals and bats very carefully uh, very soon. But again, we have three more data points in addition to the human one that um, uphold this prediction. And I think this is a nice example of a specific neural hypothesis that can be tested using the comparative approach using convergent evolution. Now, of course, one of the beautiful things about songbird vocal learning is that it also opens an arena to start talking about animal culture because we know that because birds learn songs from each other, it's basically passed down over multiple generations and songs change so that we see, for example, in, in songbirds in Europe, we see dialectal differences between the songs in Edinburgh and the ones in France and the ones here in, in Austria. So this is an example, I think it's perfectly reasonable to call this animal culture. And uh, these are, again, pretty well studied phenomenon. And we can even study how innate biases interact with learning to very rapidly, the kind of sort of weak biases that Simon and Tom, well, that Tom Griffiths talked about in his last talk, and Simon Kirby has talked a lot about, can lead to something quite um, reminiscent of normal song in a relatively short period in three or four generations of cultural transmission. So I think, again, this is where the convergent evolution in birds provides a really powerful tool for understanding this aspect of our biology. All right, so I hope to have convinced you with the speech example that we can use comparative biology to not just develop hypotheses, but also to test them using living species. Let's not focus just on fossils or on dead animals. Let's look at real living species and uh, test these hypotheses. So I think this is a pretty clear example of a clear um, and well-tested uh, specific neural hypothesis. So now in the second, the end of the talk, I wanna to turn to syntax and I wanna check how I'm doing for time. Uh, good, I'm good. Um, maybe I don't have to rush quite so much, so because uh, I, I have to be careful here because I know Ev's in the Ev Fedorenko's in the audience, and she'll probably assassinate me if I say something wrong. Um, and I'm sure we're going to disagree at the end of this, but that's part of the fun of giving a talk like this. So I, I, I want to the the second derived trait that I want to talk about is syntax, and I think you know we all know that. Um, Sign language exists, so it's not necessary to have speech to communicate linguistically. We also have written languages. So look, language is possible without speech, clearly. 
language is not possible without syntax because if you don't have a way of combining whatever your basic units are into complex structures, you're never going to have that capacity to express any of the thoughts you can think. So somehow we need a matching between our conceptual structure building capacities and our signal building capacities and syntax is exactly that link. Um, so, and again, we all know that chimpanzees can't speak, but we also probably all know that chimpanzees are much better at communicating linguistically if you give them a sign system using their hands, or in the case of Kanzi, who we see down here at the bottom, who's probably the most sophisticated example, both a combination of hand gestures and a keyboard that he can press. And each of these little keys here has a specific meaning. They mean all kinds of things, fire and grapes and apple and tickle and basket, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And Kanzi can use these, these um, it's called Yerkish, you can use the Yerkish keyboard combined with gestures to be quite clear about what he wants. Now, um, Kanzi usually uses this to make imperative statements. So he does a lot of, you know, tickle, gimme, or apple, gimme, but he uses a specific two sign syntax where he pushes on a, on, a, on a noun and then puts out his hand to say, I want. So something like a noun verb combination. So I think it's quite fair to say this is a, a consistent and, um, you know, it's a consistent two word syntax or something like two words, two, two morpheme syntax. Um, but that pretty much is the top. That's pretty much what the best animal example, the best ape example that we have of syntactic communication can do. And it tops out at about the same level that a two-year-old tops out. Okay, so what do we do different? What do we do that goes beyond what uh, you can't do by just putting two things together? And I think the answer is pretty clear. It's that we build up complex hierarchical structures. That's what syntax is really all about. It's about putting words together into phrases that can then be put together into larger phrases. And um, you know, here's a kind of classic example. Here's a, center Im a, a uh, embedded sentence. The boy who kicked the dog chased the girl. So, you know, if I ask who chased the girl, well, we all know because we're humans and we know language that it's the boy. But Kanzi might very well look at this, hear this same sentence and say, look, it says the dog chased the girl. Why, what do you mean the boy chased the girl? What's the boy have to do with it, right? And what we do in human language is we go beyond the serial structure to build up these, these complex hierarchical structures. And I think without that capacity, we would not have the free capacity to communicate anything we can think. And this is a simple sentence. You know, think about a novel, think about even, even a paragraph of, our, of scientific argument, how complex all of those relationships are that are built up over, over a series of say 10 or 100 words. Okay, and that to our current knowledge is something that goes beyond anything any other animal species can do. So clearly a derived trait. It's not the syntax is derived, it's that the specific type of hierarchical syntax is derived. So how do we, how do we approach this? If we, if we agree that this is one of the key derived traits in human language, how do we go about characterizing this? And I think we need to take a, a dual pronged approach. I think we need to be computationally explicit about what's really involved. And I think we also need to be neurally explicit about what specific brain regions or, or um, circuits are responsible for this capacity. And I think if we don't have both of those, we're not, we're, well, I don't think we can do the neural work if we don't have a clear computational model. So um, one of the models that's been pretty, um, well, it's pretty famous nowadays more in computer science than in linguistics, but it was originally developed by Alan Turing and then uh, augmented by Noam Chomsky is what's often called the Chomsky hierarchy. It really shouldn't be called, Chomsky hates that. He says, it's not, look, it's not my hierarchy. Let's call it the formal language hierarchy to, and uh, not the Chomsky hierarchy. But the basic idea is that we have a nested set of rule systems that can go from relatively simple and easy to characterize, the so-called finite state grammars here in the center, to the entire realm, the outer circle is whatever a Turing machine can compute. So it's the outer limits of computability. 
which pretty much all computer scientists would agree is equivalent to what a, a universal Turing machine can compute. And what Chomsky contributed to this hierarchy is the two stages in between, the so-called context-free grammars and context-sensitive grammars. And it's now pretty clear that basically humans are right on the border. We're just beyond, just a bit beyond context-free grammars, the so-called mildly context-sensitive grammars. And I'm going to assume that many of the audience, that many of the audience members are familiar with this and not go into a lot of detail about what exactly we mean here. What this computational hierarchy gives us is a very abstract and mathematical formulation of a kind of roadmap for what kinds of computations we might ask about other animals. Okay, so, you know, if we know humans are here, we want to kind of know, okay, where are chimpanzees? And if they're not there, how did we, how do you get from where they are to where we are? So that's a, a body of work that I've been involved in for more than 15 years. So basically using artificial grammar experiments to test the capacities of various species to learn various kinds of grammars. And the state of the art when I finished the CRC, well, a little bit after I finished the CRC grant, was that we'd, we had very convincing evidence in quite a few species, um, not just chimpanzees, but other monkey, other primates, other birds, um, that lots of animals can do syntax at this relatively uh, serialized finite state grammar level. So they can basically notice things about order, they can recognize when things change, they can identify grammatical and non-grammatical, they can generalize to new stimuli, etc, etc. So and there's some reviews listed here if you want to see the evidence behind this statement. Um, but what it looked like at that point is that we're still the only species that can go beyond this finite state grammar or regular grammar level. So what we, we could call the supra regular level is everything above the light green. And humans are definitely there and all these other species don't seem to be able to get that. So as I said, that was state of the art in 2018. And then I think a very important paper came along and this is, uh, I think Stan DeHaan was the, the so Wong and uh, Zhang were uh, the, the first and last author, but knowing Stan, I think he was one of the ones who suggested doing these particular grammars, which were the, a mirror grammar and a copy grammar, which are good exemplars of the context-free grammars and the context-sensitive grammars. Um, they took two monkeys, and they trained, well, they actually started with a lot more than two, but they ended up with two monkeys who could actually do exemplars of these grammars and pass all of the tests. So really show that they got the grammar. And the, the more convincing one, I would say, is the mirror grammar. So that's where you have things arranged in an A, B, C, C, B, A uh, order. So that's why it's called a mirror grammar. Now, one of the crucial things about this experiment is they didn't use visual or auditory stimuli, which most of the previous work had done. They used a visual motor task. So the, the monkey, the, the macaque's task was to basically tap out positions on a grid, on a touch screen, in particular orders. And they were trained, and then they were given the beginning of a sequence, and then they had to complete that sequence. So it's a, a visual motor task. And I think it, the fact that it had this strong motor component is one of the reasons that they succeeded. And again, they, I, I think this is a bona fide de demonstration of an animal going beyond the regular grammar level, be going beyond these finite state grammars that I talked about. Um, and it, if you just look time 100, okay, it doesn't look like it took too long. Well, actually, what the monkeys, what each of those numbers is 800 trials, okay? So in order to reach the criterion, we're looking at 80,000 to 160,000 trials of training before the monkeys actually reach the criteria. So we're talking about several monkey, uh, several years of these monkeys' lives every day working on this touch screen to actually make it to the point where they could pass these tests. As I said, a bunch of monkeys dropped out. Okay. Now, so yes, animals can, or at least one monkey species can do a, a super regular grammar but it's very, very hard. It's not something they would ever learn in their natural environment. They don't have the reward structures or the proclivity to do this. Their innate biases are all in the wrong place. So what I really like about this paper is they also did the same experiment. Now they brought in touchscreens to preschoolers and they let kids do it. Same grammars, same task. They didn't give them food rewards. I think, well, maybe they give them candy at the end. Um, these kids learned it in five demonstrations. <laughs> <laughs> so same gra mirror grammar, uh, copy grammar, preschoolers can do this with five, uh, on average, five, five training trials, okay?
So what we have here, you know, we could argue, is this a quantitative difference or a qualitative difference? I think for, from an evolutionary point of view, it's a qualitative difference. It's something that any preschooler is going to pick up. It's so easy that as long as they have the right data, they're going to get this, whereas any monkey in anything like a natural monkey environment is never going to get it. So it's, it is essentially a qualitative difference. But what I think it opens the door to is, you know, so it's, it's beautiful for biology. We don't like it when things are hard, you know, fast, binary, black and white distinctions. But it really illustrates that humans are really good at this. And so I want to end by talking about my hypothesis for what is really involved here. So that's a kind of computational behavioral perspective. And I want to end with some speculations about what underlies this neurally. So first of all, the hypothesis, I call it dendrophilia, because remembering that tree structure that I showed you at the beginning, the idea is that humans love trees, that we have an innate inductive bias. We have an innate uh, instinct to learn tree structures, to infer tree structures in our environment. Now, I don't, by, according to this hypothesis, it's not limited to language. It's equally true in music, and we know now that we can do it in visual domains as well. So this is not something that's only true of language or only true of sound sequences. It's a general purpose capacity, so it's multi-domain. Um, it's not just the ability to do that. The monkeys have the ability to do it. They just don't have the propensity to do it. We also have this strong drive to pick up these tree structures, so much that we'll infer tree structures even when the data doesn't indicate that we need them. We'll infer a tree structure when, in fact, a serial structure would do just as well. Okay, and in order to do that, you need super regularity. You need to, to in order to build these tree structures, you need to go beyond that regular grammar or finite state grammar level of the Chomsky hierarchy. So I want to end with a few slides about how I think we do that, or what aspects of our, what specific aspects of our brain structure allow that. And I want to start with it. This is a slide from Peter Hagort, who's talked a lot about these problems, not just in syntax but in all of language. And he suggests that the unify operation is basically using a, a system of different brain regions, but that a crucial role is played here in the prefrontal cortex that we see in the front. Um, it's, it plays a role as a hub for binding together the uh, temporal lobe and the uh, occipital and parietal lobes. So we have different computations happening in these places, but in order for language to work, we need to bring them together. So this is the, la or at least one part of this is the language system that um, Ev Fedorenko told us about this in the first talk. And uh, what what Hagort suggested, and what I want to emphasize, is that the, the role of the IFG, of the uh, inferior frontal gyrus, is as a kind of hub for combining these more data-driven parts. So this goes back, of course, to the IFG is also the, the location of Broca's area, which is uh, kind of becoming a dirty word because we know it's not one region that does one thing. It seems to do a lot of different things, but it has the right location. It's in the inferior frontal gyrus and in frontal gyrus in general. And in humans, it's connected with all of these other areas, particularly in the temporal cortex that are crucial, temporal and parietal cor cortex that are crucial for language. And so what I want to suggest to be specific is a neurocomputational hypothesis that Broca's or let's call it IFG, plays the role of a stack in computer science terminology. That's its biological role is to basically hold intermediate results of the computations that are done in other distributed parts of the language system. So the, the computational underpinnings here are the idea of a here's a here's a finite state machine, which basically has just a finite set of states, and it has some input tape that it can run through. All you need to add to that to get something that's super regular, to get a context-free uh, grammar, is a pushdown stack. And this is a very limited form of memory that can only store results in a particular order. So it can, it's really good at doing things like this mirror grammar or, or center embedding. And that's all you need. This pushdown stack is all you need to open up this uh, higher domain of the, of the formal language hierarchy. So this was, again, one of Chomsky's contributions to this whole thing. So what I want to suggest is that the role of this pushdown stack is being played by roughly the area in the inferior frontal gyrus that people refer to as Broca's area. So here's a bit of evidence. Um, there's, I think there's a lot of studies I could cite, but this is just a really nice one, again from Stan DeHaan's group, um, showing that basically the activation, this is an fMRI study, the activation of these inferior frontal gyrus regions increases it increases with lots of things in language, as Ev told us, it increases with meaning, with words, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. but it specifically increases as you increase the complexity, this chunk size of the chunks that we need to process. Okay? So in, or, in other words, as you add uh, information onto the stack, onto the short-term memory stack, um, 
you, we get increased activation in this in this hub of the inferior frontal gyrus. So, um, and I, I'm sure we'll hear more about this in the discussion section. So I'll leave it at that. I do want to end with two crucial bits of evidence, which are about neuroanatomy. And here, I think no one can argue. Um, the first is a very painstaking experiment done by Natalie Shanker and colleagues, um, looking at the sizes of different cortical regions, comparing chimpanzees and humans. And in particular, they were interested in Broca's region, which they define as area 44 and 45. And what we see in this, this is, this is the factor by which the human um, area increases. So just start with V1. So down here, V1 has only increased by less than twice. It's only twice as big in humans as in chimpanzees. Okay, so our primary visual cortex isn't that much bigger. It's about the same as the number of neurons that we have more. But if we look at area 44 or area 45 here, whoops, um, we see a six to seven percent, uh, six to seven fold increase in the size of this specific partial of cor uh, parcel of cortex. Okay defined site architectonically. Now, the only region that even compares is another frontal region. That's area 10. It's unfortunately based on a single N, uh, N of one chimpanzee and one human. So I'm not sure how we can have how seriously we can take that. But you know, this is consistent with the idea that there's a general expansion of frontal cortex, but a quite specific increase in this particular area of BA 44 and 45. Now the second part of the, that, that alone wouldn't tell us much of anything. It just says, okay, that the hub area is increased. What's also clearly increased in our species is the connectivity of these, this inferior frontal gyrus to other parts of the cortex, particularly to the parietal and temporal cortex. This is work that started with Jim Rilling. Um, and what we see here is massive connectivity in humans between IFG, the temporal cortex and parietal cortex. Whereas if, if we look in chimpanzees, it's less and doesn't make it throughout the whole temporal cortex. And in monkeys, this superior, this so-called ar arcuate fasciculus is almost not even present. It's so small that you can barely see it. Okay, so again, it's not it's not an absolute difference. It's a relative difference, but there's been a massive increase in the connectivity between these different regions, the different components of what Lev called the uh, what Ev called the language system. Okay, um, and here's just another confirmation of that using totally different methods, but also comparing macaques and humans. This is a paper by Roger Mars showing, and what red shows is the areas in which the connectivity of the human brain deviates the most from a macaque, from that of a macaque. And again, we see IFG and this entire swath of temporal cortex that the arcuate fasciculate goes, fasciculus goes into, that entire swath has massively expanded. So I think, again, these are two facts that we can take for granted, that these parts of our brain have expanded. And now the big, the million dollar question is, A, what exactly are they doing? I've offered a hypothesis, but uh, we can discuss that. And B, what are the genetic mechanisms that underlie those? Okay. Um, yeah, so there's my hypothesis. Again, I think I've, I've said it pretty clearly. This stack in our IFG has greatly increased in size and connectivity. That's what gives us our capacity to build super regular structures, which underlies this biological dendrophilia, this love of tree structures that we exhibit, not just for language, it's crucial for language, but we also do it in music and architecture and lots of other places. Okay, that's my hypothesis. Um, uh, one other thing I should, well, no, I guess I'll, I'll just jump right to the conclusions because I think I'm out of time. Yes, I'm over time. So, so general conclusions. To go beyond evolution areas, we need specific hypotheses. We need testable hypotheses. It's great to tell stories, but we need to be specific about what changed in the brain to give us merge or speech or syntax or what have you. I think we need to incorporate these innate biological differences between our species and others. That doesn't mean that language change or culture isn't important. It means that we need to see those as equal partners in the process of cultural evolution and biological evolution that our species went through in the last six million years. Um, I hope to have shown you why we need to study a wide range of species. We can't just look at chimpanzees. We, we need to also look at, a, at other species if we want to test these hypotheses. And I hope to have convinced everybody that the determinants of speech are neural um, and it's not our vocal anatomy, that it's not uh, monkey's vocal anatomy that keeps us from talking. 
But more tentatively, I want to suggest that a really crucial aspect of the human mind, one of the really crucial aspects of human uniqueness, is our dendrophilia, our, our propensity to find, to seek out tree structures, to infer tree structures in our environment. That seems like something that also differentiates us behaviorally from other animals. And now the million dollar question is, what, what underlies that neurally, and what are the genetic bases for that? Okay, um, thanks to all my contributors. I apologize for going over time. I, I, this is what happens. I thought, oh, I've got plenty of time, and so I slowed down and didn't finish. Um, in particular, Bart de Boer and Asif Ghazanfar, who I mentioned, who uh, were involved in the, the monkey work, and lots of other people who did all the animal testing that I mentioned more briefly. And thank you for your attention. I hear this very muffled, sort of distant uh, sound that I think must be applause. So thank you. <laughs> um, thanks very much uh, to, to come, sir. So um, the way we'll handle the question session is first I'll open uh, questions to our panel of other speakers in the series. Um, I'd encourage uh, the audience online to type in questions to the Q&A and upvote questions that appear there that you're interested in hearing. After a bit of time with the panel questions, I'll open it up to the floor and read out the questions in the Q&A. So to come see, you don't need to have a look at anything text-based. So okay. um, from, our, from our panel, who would like to go first? Ev. Yes, I How predictable. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Um, I, yeah, so, so I mean, it, it takes me, thank you very much for the great talk. Um, uh, I want to emphasize um, that I thought this hypothesis of a domain general hub that supports hierarchical structure building cross domains was a really cool hypothesis. This is in part a hypothesis that driven me to neuroscience and to get training with Nancy Kamushan. I really wanted to find this hub it just doesn't exist. Now, I think the kinds of things that people have found um, may well be compatible with some of what you're saying. Like for example, we have a system that is greatly expanded in humans relative to other animals, which is a system that supports task planning, complex planning, uh, goal-directed behaviors. This is a system that gives us fluid intelligence, the ability to solve novel problems, see complex patterns in data and things like that. I think that's a system that um, Tom is uh, implicitly investigating. I think it's a system that allows us to think and reason about the world. Now, it could be that language and that system overlap, but it's just empirically is not true. And IFG is not a natural enough kind to talk about it as a unit. IFG is an incredibly complex heterogeneous patch of cortex. And even though like in the 90s, when people started doing brain imaging, they talked about brain in terms of these very coarse areas, right? Superior temporal sulcus, inferior frontal gyrus, the cerebellum. Like over the last bunch of years, we have really moved towards what's now called precision fMRI, where we identify uh, structurally and functionally distinct bits that whose profiles are really, really very distinct. So I think like your dendrophilia story, I think it applies very much to this domain general multiple demand system that support and general thinking. It just so happens that that system is very distinct from language. Doesn't mean that they couldn't uh, implement similar computations. They could well be. We have a, a paper in current directions in psych science uh, with um, Corey Shane articulating that. But it's, the implementation is not as a shared hub. It's as these parallel interdigitated networks. It's more of a comment than a question, I guess. Yeah, well, I mean, this is, of course, it goes back to the question I asked you right after your talk, which is, when you say complex planning, give me a, a computational definition of complex planning that takes the kind of complex planning that chimpanzees do and leaves it out because humans are a lot better at complex planning than chimpanzees. But it's not like you know, chimpanzees can't do complex planning. They can leave sticks. So they have stones. They they go. They know where the stones are. They know, they pick up nuts and bring them back. They knock things together. It takes a long time to learn. That's complex. It's culturally transmitted. It involves you know conceptual structures that are pretty damn sophisticated. And, you know, and of course, chimpanzees also have a Broca's area. It's just really small compared to us. So, so it, it, to me, it's not enough to say it's about thinking and language is an example of thinking. Yeah, OK, I'm happy to accept that. So is music. So is art. But I want to be specific about what aspects of thinking 
change between us and animals because chimpanzees can think too and so can macaques we can all think and so I think we, we can't really put our finger on what the neural bases or what the gen and I think more importantly to test these hypotheses the genetic bases we can't put our finger on those unless we're more specific about what that means and it, and I don't think you know action planning look that's what the monkeys are good at that, that's, and chimpanzees are really good at it Oh, so that, that's asking, not, I think, yeah, sorry. You're, you're not asking the question about what differentiates us. You're really asking a within human question about what differentiates language from music, from, from some, from uh, concepts, etc. I'm asking a different question. And I think in that case, I'm more interested in the forest than the specific trees that you've spent your career very nicely uh, illustrating. I, and I don't argue against any of that. But I think you, you're, you're, you're arguing with some other big guns in your field if you say that a, there's no general role of the frontal cortex, and particularly the, the just anterior to motor portion of the frontal cortex, like the IFG. If, it, you're, if you're really saying there's no general computational role that plays a role in language and planning and music, et cetera, well, then you disagree with a lot of other people besides just me. Well, I don't mind disagreeing with people at all. I just go with the evidence, right? Like if you find that you have two nearby bits of cortex that show fundamentally distinct functional properties, differential connectivity to other parts of the brain, differential cell properties, well, they presumably are somehow different, right? If we see distinctions in nature, it makes sense to treat those distinctions as serious. And again, I'm not saying that some computation didn't emerge in humans, perhaps across the whole association cortex that allows us to not only, um, you know, perform complex linguistic operations, but also complex thinking and reasoning and think further into the past or plan further into the future. What I'm saying is that implementationally, it's not the case that there is a single hub that supports things like music structure processing and language structure processing. That's just the data. Like I, you know, like I said, my prior was also on a shared hub, and I thought it was a really cool idea. Whoa, 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 it's whoa, just whoa. empirically but not. So I thought I was very careful of to not say that. I mean, that's why I started with with Hogwarts. Thing. I didn't. He didn't. He doesn't have one hub. We're talking about a general area that serves a as a hub for not a single area that's the hub for everything, but a region that has hubs, different hubs for music, for language, etc. That's, that's why I don't see there as being any big. So if we talk about the region of IFG in a broad sense, that there are specific parcels that play hub roles in for different kinds of phenomena, whether that be complex thought or pragmatics or jokes or, or music, et cetera, et cetera, then I don't think we have an argument. And the other well, thing I think that we probably shouldn't, I mean, we can debate yeah, this yeah, all, sure. all, all night, but the question of where those, where those areas come from is not something we can assume that they're genetically determined. We know, for example, that that um, the reading areas that any literate person has, I mean, again, Stan DeHaan's work shows this very nicely. Yeah, if you're exposed to reading from an early age, you get particular reading devoted areas in your brain that are devoted to orthography. That doesn't mean that that's something that evolved, that, that we have gen we have a genetic basis to do that, but we don't have any specific, it's, it's unlikely that we have specific alleles that evolved for reading, right? Because it's only been around for a few thousand years. So, so the, the, the fact that I see in an adult a parcellation does not mean that each of those parcels has specifically evolved for specific purposes. I never, well, I, I almost certainly do not think that we have special evolved machinery for language. I would be the last person to argue for that. Um, one important thing to point out, and I'll stop there and we can continue the discussion at some next venue, is that a lot of complex thinking does not draw on uh, prefrontal cortex. For example, reasoning about other minds, the most specific component of that system resides at the junction of temporal and parietal cortex in the right hemisphere. Nothing to do, and this is, you know, this is part of what you're saying is very complex, right? Thinking about what somebody else is thinking. That's Rebecca Sachs's work and many others yeah. since then. So it's not like all complexity in thought and other domains is linked to prefrontal cortex. I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> I'm amazed. I, so, so Theory of mind happens in the TPJ. That's a very surprising comment. It happens in the whole brain, and the TPJ plays a crucial role, but it's a distributed, a distributed process, right? system. Yeah. But none of it is on the lateral surface of the frontal cortex. There's medial frontal bits that are very important, and the okay. temporal parietal junction is the thing that's most selective for theory of mind. That's all. I'm, I'm keen at this point to, to make sure we don't use up all of it. We, we ha actually do have limited time. So, <laughs> um, uh, Asphalt or Tom, do you have um, something you would like to add? 
Sure, I just, um, just going right to the beginning of your talk to come, so when you were defining the unique aspect of human language compared to animal communication systems, and there's two ways to understand what you were saying, and I wasn't quite sure which you intended. Uh, so one is what distinguishes human languages is the productivity to generate new concepts or complex thought. The other was ex the um, notion of expressibility, that what distinguishes human languages is we can express any thought at all. Um, which of those did you intend? I, well, you got me because I think that's a crucial central question. The degree to which our capacity to build complex conceptual structures is tied to our capacity to build complex linguistic structures is I think uh, remains a big open question. So Chomsky's hypothesis makes it really simple. It's like, okay, you get merged, it's useful for conceptual structures. And I think it's true. If you if you got the capacity to build hierarchical structures, even in the privacy of your own brain, that could be selected for. But what we also know is that once we have language, once we as a cultural species have language, we're also absorbing the thoughts of others through language. And, you know, and so we and, and we develop languages that can talk about certain things easily and you know, have words for certain things and don't have words for other things. And I think it's also indubitable that once you've got communication, that that starts to inhabit our brains, that that colonizes our brains. And it becomes very difficult in an adult human in today's world to separate concepts from conceptual structures from linguistic structures. So I don't I, I can't answer that question because I think we we really would need. I'm surprised that because that, that, that I'm surprised because that makes you sound like a Warfian, which I wouldn't have thought you were. I, I'm not a Warfian in the sense that I think language determines our thoughts, but I think a lot of our thinking is clearly influenced by what people have said. So, you know, that, that to me is, it's not Warfian, that's just a sort of statement of common sense that most of what we know, you know, whatever, I, I, I know that uh, Canberra is the capital of Australia, but I've never been to Canberra. What, that's not a conceptual structure that I built the way a monkey learning how to climb a tree or how to, how to find a, a new thing. You know, I didn't build that structure by brute force myself I just I stole it from from my linguistic environment that our brains are full of those kinds of linguistically um, carried memes I, I like the word meme myself I think is indubitable and that that doesn't uh, commit me to any kind of warfian our thought is purely determined I certainly don't believe that because I don't think for example my capacity to think musically is determined by my capacity to have words about those those musical structures for example so yeah, no, I don't mean to be a Warfian there. I, I do mean to just state the obvious that language strongly influences human thinking in any um, normal modern human. But which came first? Whether the conceptual structures came first or say syntactic structures, that's that's one of the, I think that's really one of the big questions. And I'm I, all I will say is, I think those are both plausible hypotheses. And I think our job as a field is to figure out how to test those. Does that make sense? Yep. Thank you. Tom. Yeah, so two clarifications, then hopefully a, a quick question. So the clarifications were, um, I, I don't think, you know, transmission replaces, <laughs> cultural transmission replaces biological evolution. There, there is a thing that I think, which is that um, the effects of cultural transmission can be greater than the effects of selection in the sense of cultural selection in that setting, ah. which is not something that we expect when thinking about biological evolution, where selections are strong force and mutations are weak force. But in the cultural setting, you can have scenarios where mutation through transmission overwhelms even relatively strong selective forces. And that's why inductive biases are such a challenge in that context. Um, and the second was uh, the PDE picture that you showed. I think that particular example might be a little misleading in that you're getting convergence to a point. Absolutely. And the kind of convergence that we have in the sorts of models we were talking about is convergence to an equilibrium, which is actually a distributional equilibrium. And I think that gives you a better argument for the kind of you know, idea that you're pushing for there. But one interesting thing is that you only get those distributional equilibria in the presence of mutation. So if you had just selective forces at work, they drive you to that, that sort of point. 
And so that's an interesting piece of evidence that, that something about, you know, transmission processes is actually doing something interesting in the context of producing that diversity that you end up seeing. Um, so the, the, the question was, I, I was, you know, I thought your stack hypothesis was fascinating. Um, one kind of interesting point about stack, you know, stack automata is you have this very specific constraint that it's a, a last in first out structure. Right. And if you relax that constraint, so even if you're able to read anywhere in the stack, then you immediately get into the world of context sensitive grammars, right? That, that right. creates an automaton that has that capacity. And I'm curious whether you think that that constraint holds and how you think that those results relate to the sort of mildly context sensitive horizon that you were talking about. Well, I, I mean, this actually goes back to what um, that nice question, by the way. And yes, I, I agree with both of your previous points. I just like that picture. I mean, it's it's not the best model. The PDE is not the best model of the complexity of the human brain, obviously. Um, so I, I think the, the idea that multiple stacks give you a, a huge amount more power than just having a single first in first out stack makes a lot of biological it is very biologically plausible when we think about the parallel structure of the brain. And I think it goes back to what Ev and I were discussing, that it's probably not one stack, it's probably multiple stacks. And I think Hagort's idea about unify is that you've kind of, and, and this is also consistent with some of Jackendorf's ideas about the parallel architecture, though a little more computationally specific. Having parallel stacks that can store different information in different places actually increases the computational power of the system in a, in a very significant way. I mean, it goes, it, you know, it goes beyond from context free to context sensitive. And I think that may be one of the reasons that syntax, semantics, and phonology have their somewhat separate domains, that they're somewhat uh, compartmentalized because they actually are helping each other from a computational point of view. And I think a lot of the stuff that we know about learning, you know, how kids learn words, and I know the island hypothesis of, of Tomasello is a bit discredited, but I, I kind of like this idea that we pick up these chunks and it takes a long time for the, for the child to basically start dividing those up into their component pieces and recombining them, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that having a serial system that basically, you know, the phonetic system or the phonological system, which is a serial system, that's easy for the brain. That's what brains are good at. And have be able to store some sentence but that you can't completely parse, but keep coming back to it and finally get a parse for it, I think it really increases the power of the system. So I think that maybe a, a, a sort of multi-stack automaton might be part of the answer to how we're how kids are so amazingly good. At, at coming up with the right hypothesis nine times out of ten in a very with a very limited set of data in a very limited amount of time. So um, we've only got a few minutes left. But I'm going to see if we can get through some of the questions that are coming in um, uh, over the tubes. Um, so a question from Michael Player, um, a short question: um, Is an instinct to learn language? equivalent to an instinct to construct a language, which I think is actually a pretty clever question. Mm -hmm. that, is a, that is a clever question. I mean, my example of Romulus and Remus, I, my older brothers are twins, and there is this, you know, it's a pretty standard phenomenon that twins do weird stuff and they develop weird little communicative things themselves. So, I mean, we also know that a human raised in complete isolation will not develop language. So I think you need at least some communicative interaction, but the degree to which that can kind of bootstrap once you've got this instinct to learn language, that it also, you know, obviously it's combined with the expressive power, that that can bootstrap pretty quickly into something that you might want to call a language, I think is a very plausible idea. I mean, if you look at uh, Olga Feyer's bird experiments that I mentioned briefly, it's amazing. So basically, they raise these birds with no input, and the, the first generation produces squawks, nothing that sounds like a zebra finch. But then they're learned by other birds who select out parts, and then those are passed to another set of birds. And after four generations, it sounds like zebra finch song. So it's a, you know, I think the idea that this can bootstrap, once you have these strong innate biases, that it can bootstrap into something you'd call an actual language. Because those zebra finch, it's it's a new song. It's a brand new zebra finch song in in the history of zebra finches. So you know, I think it's quite plausible that uh, that that those two are, are go hand in hand. Thanks, uh, Kenny. Thanks, thanks for a fantastic 
talk to come. So I had a, a question about a, a, a transition you made during the talks. So you went from talking about what are the traits that differentiate humans from our, our, our close relatives like chimpanzees, and then gradually you kind of started chipping away at that to make it more a kind of quantitative difference, so a matter of degree. So you give the example of the um, super regular grammar learning, and I think one could make similar arguments that there's maybe a bit of evidence for some very limited maybe vocal learning or theory of mind in chimpanzees, potentially. So I know you don't disagree with all of that evidence, but I can imagine that argument being made. So I'm just wondering how I should feel about that. Like, should we should we be relaxed if somebody produces a bit of evidence that, that, that a chimpanzee can do a bit of hierarchy? Or, or should we still be looking for these kinds of qualitative differences? No. So look, I think ultimately the question is not, can they do X? I think that the, unfortunately the field of animal cognition has been a little bit obsessed with proving that animals can do something humans can do. We choose some favorite trait of humans and now we try and show our animals can do it. And I think that leads us, that often leads us down the garden path because for example, with these macaques, yes, they can do it. I don't think there's any, any argument that they're not doing it. It's just that the mechanisms that they're using to do it are almost certainly different from ours. And even if they're using the same brain areas, those brain areas are differently equipped. They have different memory resources, different connectivity, et cetera, et cetera. I think it becomes kind of an arbitrary question whether we want to call that a qualitative or a quantitative difference. The question is, is there a derived feature, a biologically derived feature? And if so, how is it implemented early and how, what are the genetic bases for that? Th those are the questions we want to answer. And it doesn't really, I mean, in, in a way, I would be overjoyed. You know, this is this example from from uh, Jang et al is beautiful because now we can have, finally have an animal model where we can look and we can see how they do it. We can ask our, you know, do, do these differences in Broca's areas and its or IFG and its connectivity really make the difference? And, and I think now we've got to. So, yeah, I would be overjoyed if we had uh, better evidence of chimpanzee vocal learning. For now, I would say. Don't waste your time on chimpanzees. Look at birds, where they obviously do vocal learning. They're really good at it, and we can study the biology of that. So yeah, I, I, you know, Darwinians are naturally averse to qualitative binary differences. So I'm perfectly happy with seeing everything as you know gradual. But let's not overdo it. Let's not say a tiny bit of evidence for X means they've got X. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, I think it's a mark of an excellent and thought-provoking talk that we've got way more questions than we have time, sadly, um, uh, and we'll have to wrap it up there. So let's thanks to come say again. Thank you. And I would be happy to see the, the questions. I, I mean, I look in my chat and I don't see them. I mean, I'd be happy to answer some questions, some more questions. Uh, but you may you you may be able to look in the Q and A button. I don't know if you have that there, so I'm not oh, sure. I see. If that, oh, I see. Um, Am I? <laughs> but we we have to we have to wrap now. And this questions. Um, I also have a screen full of questions on my notes, but we will have plenty of chance to come say in the future for me to go through them. Um, but we have to wrap now and thank you all for coming and I hope you'll all be here um, next Thursday for the last of our series of Edinburgh Lectures and Language Evolution for 2022 from Asfer Majid. Thanks everyone.